Hello and welcome to the Manchester is Red podcast. My name is Stephen Railston. We're recording this episode on a Monday morning, a few days after United got their Premier League season off the winning start against Fulham. A 1-0 win at Old Trafford on Friday night. I was at that game with Samuel Luckhurst and as usual I'm joined by him on this podcast. Samuel, did you have a good Saturday and Sunday after the, the game on Friday night? I did, thank you. It's It was probably the, the, the upshot of, of doing a Friday night game despite having to battle through the uh, reliably uh, congested Manchester traffic on the Friday. But it's uh, it's I, I guess it's a novelty, these these Friday night games. But it does mean you get you get a weekend, although I almost feel I don't I don't feel me not just having a full weekend. It, it doesn't feel right. It feels like one should be at a. At a football ground on on one of the two days, but uh, yeah, a, a rarity nevertheless. I made a lot of my time. I went to Kinder Scout, which is the highest point in the Peak District on Saturday morning. I was back for the football on Saturday afternoon. All the Premier League games kicking off, and I played golf on Sunday. So, can United play on Friday every week? I wouldn't mind it at all. Um, one nil, Samuel. Fulham kind of took control in the first twenty minutes. Um, United created a few good opportunities after that, and then Joshua Zirks, he came off the bench, scored a goal. Um, a very intelligent finish. When I saw it at first, I almost thought it kind of deflected off his shin or came in off his knee. But the way he uses his studs to angle that ball into the bottom left corner was actually very clever. And he obviously meant to do it. So, look, the perfect start, three points on the board. We'll pick apart the performance in a bit more detail. But what was your general reaction? Very positive night because they won. Clean sheet, goal-scoring debutant, uh, late goal as well. So that that feel-good mood is was was bound to be fueled uh, if if they had drawn that game it would have been a very different reaction of course as you said i thought fulham were, were good in the first 20 minutes thereafter there was nothing that they were about as good as their supporters really um i, I think people have an idea of of, of what fulham's uh, f- following is like home and away and apart from that Two on one, which Andres Pereira really badly bungled uh, with about twenty odd minutes to go. That they didn't really show much about them in the second half, and it did feel like that was a big moment at the time. Uh, that that was Fulham should have scored from from that opportunity. It was it was that great uh, great chance. But United had four great chances either side of, of Xerxes' goal, and they ended up winning the game with, by far and away, the hardest of those chances. You look at the two for Fernandez; he hits the ball straight at Leno. Mason Mount hits the ball straight at Leno. Uh, Rashford for Garnacho. both poor play from both of them there. Poor pass for Garnacho, slightly behind him. He should still be scoring that. And that's what Ten Hag touched upon afterwards. He said, we shouldn't be needing a late, a late goal to win this game. And... I'd, I'd say the performance, although it's a different level of competitiveness from, I mean, Liverpool, City and uh, Fulham, it's been a different level of competitiveness, intensity on each one because it was a friendly, then it was a community shield, then, of course, it's the opening Premier League game. I'd say United actually, and, and the two the two games before Fulham were, were pretty watchable. United, I'd say, played better in, in the game that they lost 3-0 to Liverpool in and um, and in the community shield, which they should have won, but of course didn't. Yet they were undeniably worthy winners. I thought the defenders played very well. Uh, they limited Fulham. Fulham didn't really have a standout, genuine chance apart from that two-on-one, of course, and that didn't come to anything because Pereira couldn't make a very easy pass. And United created four four great chances. So uh, it, it would have been extremely galling for them had they not won that game. And, and credit to Xerxes because... He was he was very quiet when he came into the game, and watching him, you you thought, well, it's it's pretty clear why why Ten Hag didn't didn't use him in the Community Shield. He, he didn't necessarily seem in sync, but then with that goal, it, it was everything that his game is about. It's dropping off, it's getting the ball, and it's a very simple characteristic for striker. But what I liked about him was that as soon as he lays that ball off, he's not thinking give it back to me. He, he's not eager to get on the ball straight again. It's, I've got to get in the penalty area here and get the ball in for me and I'll, I'll try and do something. And he did do something. As you said, it was a really well, really well taken goal. The, the previous chances where Leno made the saves, they weren't they weren't great saves. They weren't superb saves. The ball was hit straight at him. The, the, Mason Mount and Bruno Fernandes gave him a prayer. Xerxes took the ball, t- sorry, took the pace off the ball just trickled into the corner of the net. And as you said, it gave the illusion that 
he had that it wasn't clean contact that it might might have hit his knee and gone in or hit his ankle or hit some other part of his anatomy and gone in but it was a very deliberate and a very clever finish i spoke to him in the mix zone afterwards um i realized when i watched this interview with club media last month after he sang that he came across very laid back and very relaxed and that impression was reaffirmed when speaking to him for around five minutes um i think andy mitten opened up with a question about well come on in how do you feel after scoring at the stripford end on your debut with a few minutes to play i think he just replied yes very good <laughs> with, a, with an endearing little smile on his face it took a little while for him to warm up when we spoke to him but he did in the end and produced some decent quotes um so i don't think anything's going to phase him during his time at the club he's clearly cut out for dealing with the pressure and that can only board well so it's exciting to see how he um, kick on after that debut because when you score on your first appearance that's just brilliant isn't it it's all you can do um the defensive performance was excellent as you said as well i was very impressed by that i thought maguire had a very good game martinez as well yeah. um he came across didn't he and dealt with Traore at one point i think he said in his quotes after that he sent him to the gym so fair play martinez um there was a few uh, errand passes from martinez i think some some sloppy but you can say that's his first appearance of the season competitive he's allowed to do that and then going on to the the fullback position samuel Mazwari, i thought had a great game a great debut a very confident start he was very athletic coming up and down the line very technically sound comfortable with the ball at his feet and he definitely looks like an upgrade on wamba saka already i mean come on the word the word great you have to be like that's that's the literally the highest bar possible it wasn't great it was very good he, he and that's not i'm not doing him a disservice it's but it, it was not a great debut a great debut would be creating a goal and, and scoring a goal i think uh for, for, for a fullback but he he did really well i thought he was one of united's best players i mean ten Hag said on thursday that he's very good at dealing with pressure on the ball he can get out of difficult situations there wasn't a great deal of pressure on him from fulham but they have got some handy players. Uh, Iwobi, I mean, Triori is, I, I, I see him as kind of like a more muscular version of Theo Walcott, someone who probably should be playing, you know, doing track track and field rather than playing football. But it, when he comes at you, he, he he can be a real, you know, certainly in that first duel with Martinez, he got past him and I think he probably scared the Jesus out of some, some fans in the Stratford end. But Masrawi read the danger really, really well. And I, I thought he would be the one the, the, the likely of the two Dutch signings last week who would come in and make their full day just because he was needed a lot more. And we were trying to, I think the, the general consensus on the Thursday was that maybe it would still be Martinez at left back and it would be De Litt who comes in, just trying to guess what, what Ten Hag would do. And in the end, Masrari did come in the team and he came in the team at right back with Dallow switching to left back again. Uh, that's I'd have been interested to see how Masrari would have played at left back um, given the, the experience that he's got playing there. I mean, he played a whole World Cup there for Morocco. But in terms of easing a new signing in, it, it made infinite sense to play him there. Dallo is dependable there. I, I didn't think Dallo had a good game, but he didn't, you know, that, that was more a case of what 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 he didn't do rather than what he did do. Um, it's, it's just, I think, if you're a, a right back and you're playing left back, you are going to be inhibited. And I thought that was pretty apparent in United's play. And it, it wasn't a surprise that the goal came from the right hand side with 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 Garnacho coming on as well and of course Ahmad had that little charge in the first half on top of that but certainly encouraging that of you know, a few signings come in I mean Dilit had a cameo as well and and helped United keep a clean sheet in in pretty difficult circumstances as well I suppose given that that, that some of those defensive changes seemed in force I think Maguire where he's had a, an issue of some sorts in in recent weeks he couldn't complete 90 minutes so Johnny Evans came on, Delict came on. So it was a very different defence at the end of the game to the start of the game. But they still kept a clean sheet despite that that lack of stability in the back line again, and it, it with some enforced changes. But it will do the Masrawi the power of good to have come in, played as well as he did. I think had the game ended nil nil, United probably would have given him their the, the club man of the match if they'd even have bothered with that. In the end, of course, with Xerxes getting the winning goal, it was inevitable that he would he would pick up that award. But good going for United, good going for the new signings that three of them have come in, and have, uh, they they all had a good night. No two ways about it. Yeah, is great getting carried away. Clean sheet. I mean that contribution coming across the line and reading that play, covering for Dallo and. In- getting into the box and like, you say great like who's, who's a great a, but without but, that he but great 
very good. He, he could get fair. a goal. He could get an assist. Yeah, I mean, he, he got a very a very good. Uh, I mean, if you get seven seven in the player yeah. ratings, that is that's the mark that you've had a good game. So that's that's the way I saw it with with Masrauri. Um, Can and, you and remember also, what you? I mean, Fulham. Go on. So I was going to say, can you remember what you gave Ahmad and Rashford? On on Friday night, I gave Ahmad six. I think I gave Rashford five. I didn't think Ahmad think should have come off, but I think it was inevitable that he was going to come off. Just yeah, the way to the Ten Hag is, is thinking. Yeah, with Ahmad, I mean, he was clearly wanting the ball every time United had possession. He was kind of screaming um, for it to be played down his side. He looked bright, proactive again. There was that run in the box in the first half when he kind of came down in between the two Fulham players. I think he won that down. He was never going to be given. Um, he was eventually obviously brought off yeah. for, for Ganacho, who provided the assist. I mean, as you said in your, your first little snippet, I don't know how Ganacho didn't score to make it 2-0 um, in the closing stages. Do you think Ahmad's done enough to convince Tenog to start next week? I know we'll do a preview podcast later in the week. Um but it was a big decision to start Ahmad. I don't think we expected it. I think we both st- expected Ganacho and Rashford to, to start on the wings. I think when we're trying to predict the team, you're trying to look at it f- from, through the prism of, of the manager and, and Ten Hag is clearly not going to rock the boat with Rashford at the moment when I don't think you should have any compunction about it. The, the problem with, I said last week, didn't I, that Rashford missing those chances in the Community Shield, you could dismiss them because he started a couple of years ago with a bad miss against Brighton, but then he embarked in his career best season. The bigger problem on Friday night was when he went one through one-on-one with Leno, he didn't go for goal. He went to play it. He he, he went to play it to Garnacho, and he didn't play a good pass. He should still have got an assist. Garnacho should still score. But Garnacho actually had to check his run. That probably legislates for why he scuffed the ball wide in the end. It, 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 he shouldn't have. You know, a player of his quality should still be scoring that. But it said a lot about Rashford that in that angle as well, where certainly two seasons ago he is slotting it into the corner, uh, the, the the bottom bottom right hand corner past the goalkeeper, and he didn't want to do that. And if you're a manager and you see that you've got and you see Garnacho and the way he how how direct he is and how dynamic he is, and and also Ahmad is very direct as well. And I know he did fade in the second half, but. I've not seen anywhere near enough from Rashford in these first two games of the season to suggest that he should be the one who keeps his place against against Brighton. And that doesn't have to be a bad thing because there's every chance they'll need him to to bring off uh, bring him on against Brighton. He comes on and he can do well and he can score. There's there's nothing wrong with with dropping him. I think sometimes managers and and maybe it's you know it's it's a di- it's a particularly uh, fascinating case with Ten Hag where there have been a lot of changes and there is still an element of oh, he, he's on trial because of the fact that they didn't really want to keep him but in the end they were backed into the corner by by fan sentiment and that they only triggered the one new extension of his contract and they've brought all these coaching staff changes in and etc cetera, etc cetera. and maybe he doesn't want to he doesn't want to rock the boat and he wants to try and try and keep it as, as stable and as diplomatic and, and play you know, act as diplomatically as possible, but you've got to play the players who are going to get you out of a hole and uh, are the ones who deserve to be starting on form. And from what I've seen in the first two games of the season, Ahmad has been a far greater threat than Rashford. Rashford has obviously had the better chances. He's had three great chances, two in the community shield and the one the weekend. He's not taken any of them. And it, it was troubling that he went through one-on-one and he decided to square it to Garnacho and he didn't square it very well for him either. So that's that 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 would be a red flag as far as the attack is concerned. That the as as you said, in terms of the overall performance, it was it was extremely positive night for United, winning clean sheet, Xerxes scoring on his debut, defense playing well. The attack did not play well. Fernandez salvaged his performance with his role in the goal, which was pivotal the way he rolled Kearney and then he switched you know, he moved the ball inside to Xerxes and that accelerated the attack but he was not having a good game and we know he can have these games where he's playing so badly we expect him to do something because he's such a great player and he did that Mason Mount I still don't know what he does with the ball for United I see a lot of what he does off the ball because he's a really good hard worker He's he's got a hell of an ethic he presses he harries he cares he's got a a steely side to him but games get played around him you can't if you're a playmaker you can't do that you've, you've got to be affecting the play on the ball and he he has literally not done that for United 
as a starter, apart from against Crystal Palace in the League Cup last season. And let's face it, Crystal Palace could not be bothered to be in the League Cup. They couldn't be bothered to be in that game. And they it's, it's a case of rope a dope with United because they turned up a few days later and beat them in the league at Old Trafford. So that it's, it's not just Rashford who was the issue in the attack, but it was interesting, I thought, anyway. I mean, Fernandez was never going to get brought off, but when it came to those two changes and we saw that Ten Hag had summoned Xerxes and Garnacho, we we correctly guess it's going to be Mount and it's going to be Ahmad. Mount absolutely had to come off. He was slightly lucky, I thought, that he didn't come off at half-time. Xerxes came out a lot, a, quite a fair bit of time before everyone else for the second half. And there was a fitness coach with him, but then he just took his seat on the bench, so he clearly wasn't going to come off. And I don't think any of us really thought that Ten Hag would make a half-time change. Yet, if he had taken Mount off, put Xerxes up top and Fernandes behind him, it would have been perfectly understandable. That said, the obvious game-changer was always going to be Garnacho, so it was inf- it made infinite sense to bring Garnacho and Xerxes on at the same time. But that front four... I I would be not not surprised if it stayed the same against Brighton, but it certainly shouldn't stay the same against Brighton. You'd be looking at making probably two changes to that attacking quartet. Yeah, I thought Mount had a poor start to the game. The game was clearly passed him by. He was a bit quiet, a bit anonymous, to be fair. But I think he kind of started to gain presence as the half went on. He was flying into a few tackles. But you're so right. When we discuss Mason Mount, we're talking about what he does out of possession. It's his running, it's his tackles, it's his energy, his pressing. When United actually have the ball, can he get on the ball? Can he create something? Can he dictate play? We just haven't seen that yet um, with Mason Mount in a United shirt, unfortunately. So if that is the case, so surely it makes sense to bring Bruno Fernandes back to the number 10 role, which is his best position, and to play Joshua Xerxes down the middle now going into the next game because... You've just scored a goal for United. I mean, I've kind of questioned the handling of Xerxes in the first two weeks. He's only been at the club for, for probably five weeks now. Um, but I would have thrown him in for the Community Shield. I think he's got to start now against Brighton after that goal. Um, partly because I'd like to see him start down the middle, but partly because Fernandez must start in central attack and midfield for me. Yeah, and in fairness to United and Ten Hag, the, the three-point plan, if you like, for Xerxes and his integration uh, has, has paid off because in in the one game that he has appeared in, it was the it was the one that mattered most and, and he decided it. So easing him in the way they have done, uh, you know, all those justifiable misgivings and, and, and questions raised about him going back to Carrington when he was just down the road in LA on, on holiday and him not uh, not not playing any role in the community shield when Facundo Palistri was was getting a quite a quite a fair amount of playing time in that game. In the end it doesn't matter because he scored in his old Trafford debut and he won the game against Fulham. So yeah, props to Ten Hag and and the coaching staff for for their planning there. But it would be a little bit odd if if Xerxes wasn't to start against Brighton when it's I mean it's, United the benefit for United of also playing on the Friday night was, is is that it's an eight day gap. It's of course it's an early kickoff against Brighton, but it's pretty much an eight day gap between between games. And provided Xerxes stays fit, it's a full week of training, another week of um, integrating into United's demands. And let's face it, when when it came to the goal, he positioned himself perfectly to receive the ball from Fernandes. He had the awareness to shift it to his right because that was the more reliable outlet uh, in terms of service from uh, whether it was Casemiro or Garnacho. Because he went to Casemiro first, who and Casemiro created a couple of very good chances for United and then he's in the right place at the right time to get the goal. Um, Brighton have got a couple of you know, pretty um, you know, pretty physical and, and towering centre-backs as well in, in Lewis Dunk, um, is it Van Heck or, and, and Veltman, are their, their defenders as well. So I think it's in, although United beat them in the final day of last season with, uh, with, with Fernandes as the false nine, they only went 1-0 up after Hoyland came on. Hoyland, of course, caused some confusion for the first goal that Dallow got. And Hoyland, of course, got the second goal in that 2-0 win. And United were not good in the first half of that game either on the final day um, in the league last season. So having a focal point against Brighton would would be hugely beneficial to them. It, Fernandes should have rendered the absence of a focal point moot with his chances 
against Fulham and, and as I said, United did create good opportunities without Xerxes. But there's a reason why they've signed a striker um, to you know, offer competition to support Rasmus Hoyland and with Hoyland out and, and Xerxes now, I think three weeks into training, I think it was three weeks ago that he, he arrived at, at Carrington for, for the start of July the season. July 29th, yeah. Yeah, so that's... That is three weeks, isn't it? I've, I've, it doesn't feel like it was four weeks ago that I was flying to LA, but time time really does fly. So it, that's that's nearly four weeks in, effectively as a as, as a proper United player in terms of the training time. So it it would make infinite sense to to start him against Brighton, and also just because of the the makeup of the attack and how certain players underperformed against Fulham. Yeah, match of the day actually picked up on a few of his positive runs, Xerxes, which when you uh, rushing to to submit copy in the second half you might not spot actually because it, he's doing it off the ball but there's a few clever runs where he's taking the defender away Um he actually calls himself a 9.5 which is a very hipster thing to call yourself isn't it he's not a number nine yeah. he's not a number 10 he's a 9.5 i don't know how i feel about that it's just um, su- pseudo intellectuals uh, <laughs> but, but if he scores you're goals, trying to ball, make football joyless yeah i think yeah, i think ronald kuman build ronald kuman build him as that as well and it's it, it is the kind of you know jargon that the occasional um f- football uh, football figure from f- from the Netherlands might come up with because obviously it's a very technically based um approach to to the game of course from f- from the Cruyff years but you know that that total football team it was it was 4-3-3 and there was nothing particularly complicated about it it was just playing football very well and um he's he's a number 9 let's face it he's not going to be playing as a number 10 very often when you've got Fernandes and you've got Mount to play there and they've not got anyone else to play up top who's a specialist striker other than Hoyland and he's he's injured for the time being so but it was interesting I I, I messaged a, a contact who, who watched him in Italy um, and I went back to read the message just for for a morning piece and he they said that um, he's slow but good good link up play and drops back and you saw that I think all three of those um if you can call them acids, because he he clearly isn't particularly quick, which is is intriguing for a striker coming into the Premier League. But it is a different dynamic um, having him on the pitch. And although he's a similar age to Hoyland, and he had a he had a similar record to Hoyland in Italy, they are clearly not similar players. And that's only a good thing as well. Even though they are two number nines, there is the possibility that in game they can collaborate. And if you need a goal. There's there's no harm in having both of them on the pitch whatsoever. You know I'm an advocate for expected goals, but I draw the line at nine point five. Um, that's that's walk nonsense, wow. isn't it? We'll have to we'll have to stop that. <laughs> Go our country back. Uh, we'll leave it there for part one. We'll be back in a moment for part two. Welcome back to part two of the Manchester's Red podcast. Now, before the game, Samuel United's four newest signings, or four new signings, were unveiled to the Old Trafford crowd. Um, a great reception. Poor Lenny Euro was standing there on his crutches, bless him, and his, in his training kit. Mafia Stilith came on in the second half, as we just discussed. Um, and I said to you, at what point does Stilith actually get into the team? Because he thinks he's come to United to start. But Maguire and Martinez both had good games. I suppose the answer to that is probably when Maguire makes a mistake. But I think that partnership could continue for longer than people may think. Um, and it might take a little bit longer for Dillard to get into the team. It wouldn't well, it wouldn't surprise me if that was the case, although I think you've you've added a vowel into Matthias Dillard's name there. I think you you've gone with three syllables for his for his first name rather than just just the two of them. Um well, we were may, may, maybe I'll, I'll, as well. I'll, we're in the press room. I, well, I've, I've been writing about him for about five yeah. and a half years. So fortunately, once uh, Nusa Masraoui, I've, I've only just got, you know, <laughs> I've got that nailed down now. That was copy and paste for a good few weeks. But uh, Delit is um, m- maybe when he does the mix and I'll, I'll take over the, the duty for that <laughs> night and you can do Ten Hag's press conference. But it it is interesting how it goes that with that because I remember at the start of Eric Bailly's first season at United, his, uh, his partner to, you know, relative to support, Relative surprise was Daley Blind, who had played very well in Van- Louis van Gaal's second and last season at centre-back. But when Mourinho came in, you just thought, right, this guy is not 
he's, there's no way he's starting the season at, at centre back, but he did with Bay. And the two of them were doing really, really well. They won, United won their first three games. Then after September internationals, they lost to City. And for the first goal, Blind got caught out. And immediately you knew he's going to get dropped for the next game because finally Mourinho has an excuse to drop him. And uh, of course he was. And maybe that is, that's just how logic, you know, logic dictates that will be the case with um, with Maguire or, or, or Lissandro Martinez. You'd still imagine Martinez has, has got more privileges than Maguire. But Maguire has had, pretty much since he was humiliated at Hampden Park last year with that unfortunate own goal and Scottish fans goading him, he, he's had a really, really good 11 months, apart from missing the Euros and, and missing the FA Cup final. It's just such an ill-timed injury. And also, I don't think had he that injury, I think, was announced the day before United played away to Crystal Palace. And I think that if he hadn't have got that injury, I don't think United would have got uh, thrashed 4 0 by by Palace or or humbled or pummeled as 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 relentlessly as as they were because Maguire at that time was extremely important to United and he is still extremely important with with Yoro out injured and Delit a novice to to Premier League football. Johnny Evans is yeah is is, is 36. Victor Lindelof is is on a crutch as well. I mean, that's we were told it was a niggle. We were told he came off as a precaution. Now he's on a crutch. I mean, sometimes United just need to be upfront and transparent with us about a, a, a player's injury because it, it does it, it has a tendency to make them looked after at times. But Maguire is is if this is his final season at United, and it, it could well be, <clears throat> but it, it, he's he's made a good start. The dive he took in the first half was was completely unnecessary and, and very much very uncharacteristic of him. I was gonna say it's very unlike him but, to do something like that. That's awful yeah, a little it, bit of it, contact because you rarely associate that kind of behaviour with Harry Maguire. The, but the referee was was absolutely spot on. Uh, yeah. very good referee in there. But but Maguire had a good game. He was dominant in aerial duels. We we saw how dominant Rodrigo Muniz was against United at Old Trafford last season. He didn't really get a kick. It felt like uh, on, on on Friday he he was he, he seemed cowed almost. But that was also a testament to what a good job Maguire and Martinez did. I think with United in particular, the whole concept of a first eleven it almost goes out the window because they have so many injuries, um, and. That that's not they're not just the exception. Of course, lots of lots of clubs are having injuries to contend with. Rodri didn't start for City on Sunday. Guardiola didn't start the three England players who figured uh, prominently at the European Championship either in, in Walker, Stones, and, and Foden. I think Ten Hag has got to be a little bit more open to rotation this season. And what he's already said, it's the survival of the fittest, and players will get their minutes. So I think you know. The, the days when United could play uh, their outright best eleven in a good chunk of the season, I, I think they're at the moment it feels like that's that's just wishful thinking, and you know there, there'd be some debate as well as to what that that best eleven is, and they can't play at the moment anyway because Hoyland is is the number nine and he's he's out injured until after the September internationals, so. I, I think it's you've got to be pretty relaxed. It's it is around this time of year that players can get itchy feet. I remember Mourinho being unhappy with Andreas Pereira pushing for a loan move in towards the end of the August summer twenty seventeen transfer window. He'd had a very he'd been very much involved in pre season. Season started and he wasn't getting on the bench because everyone was fit at the time, and he just wanted to go off and, and play and. In the end, he, I think he had a loan move to Valencia that didn't really work out and wasn't really productive for his development as well. Because if you want to play for Man United, and he clearly wanted that, there's no logic in going to La Liga and trying to get up to speed or come down the speed, if you like, given how sedate it is there. Um, in 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 a, in a very very different league to to the Premier League, so it's it's more other players who, I mean, Pelistri's almost certainly going to leave but there are a couple of other players there that or three players I mean I, I think of if he's if he's shiftable Lindelof um Sancho and the the, the forgotten Hannibal Mejbri who was you know, posted a fitness video just over a month ago how it's going to be a special season when 
you know, he's he's never really looked close to leaving so far. And you just hope that's because he, he'll be one of those players who the, the nearer we come to deadline, the, the greater the chance there is of him of him leaving. But he, he's got to leave as well. Uh, United have got quite a big the squad size is pretty reasonable at the moment. It's it's not where it needs to be, of course, but they are getting there. I, I, I'd be cautiously optimistic that in a year's time you could look at the squad and think there's you know, they are they've effectively rebuilt the squad or they are close to a squad rebuild. Yeah, I think they've actually been quite cracked up. I think they've done well so far in the selling market. I mean, five sales already. Less true nearing in on an exit. We'll come on to it in a moment. But I mean, you can only have 11 on the pitch, 20 in the squad, of course. The squad is actually quite strong when everyone's fit. Rarely will that happen, um, especially after the injury crisis last season, you suspect. But Jaden Sancho was left out of the squad. That was the biggest omission uh, that we spotted, obviously, when the, the teams were confirmed. And now we're in 15 minutes before kickoff, not an hour. Um, Ten Hag explained that by saying he had an ear infection earlier in the week, but that he was he, fit enough to be included. So lucky like pick Cirque, Ganacho and Anthony all over Sancho. Um, that's not a surprise, but for me, Samuel, it makes it even more bizarre because I wanted to see Xerxes in the community shield and Sancho came on. I thought that was a bit strange. I suppose I can't really question that now because as you said, it paid off. Xerxes scored the winner against Fulham on his debut, but it was a bit bizarre to leave Sancho out considering he got minutes in the community shield. What they, I think it was more bizarre that Palistri and Sancho came on in in the community shield. And look, there was mitigation behind that because Maguire could only play an hour, so they needed someone to to come in and, and, and fill in with, um, you know, they, they were moving parts around. Martinez went to centre-back, didn't he? Dallow went from right-back to left-back, so they needed an auxiliary right-back. And clearly they thought, well, Palistri is a winger. He plays down that flank. He's, he's a good professional there, there is some sense. The more you talk about it, the more you can see why they did bring him on. Only that he's not a right back, and it cost them. It cost them the community shield because he he was at fault for Bernardo Silva's winning goal. Sorry, not winning goal, equalising goal that triggered the the penalty shootout. With with Sancho, it's you know Ten Hag clearly doesn't want him there. There's there's no way that Ten Hag came back in for pre season having. Um, survived the end of season review and won the FA Cup and thought, you know what, can somebody go and get Jaden? I'd really like to talk to Jaden. I'd really like to have a chat with him so that he can come back into the squad. That that would have come down, that, re- that order would have come from up on high. And, you know, the, the reticence with which Ten Hag talks about Sancho um, is, is telling as well. Uh, and I found it, I could understand it when it's a penalty shootout and you're you're trying to encourage a player, but I did find the uh, overly enthusiastic, positive reception for Sancho when he went to take his penalty to be a a little bit jarring. I'm I'm not for a single second advocating that United fans boo him, but just kind of like just ignore his existence in a way because this is a player who did what he did last season. And you look at, you look at, his Instagram page and you think, does this guy actually play for Man United? Because there's not a single mention of Manchester United on it whatsoever. He only seems to go on Instagram to give people updates on whether his TikTok has been hacked or whether it's back in his hands or what have you. Um, I saw him praise Marco Rossi the other day with a goat emoji. Yes, well, yeah, who (laughs) plays for LA Galaxy now, doesn't he? Uh, You know, he... he, Someone told me that he he commented on Bruno Fernandez's Instagram, uh, so may, maybe he's making some progress there in you know getting back to acknowledging that he's a Manchester United player because at the moment it seems like he's he's living in denial. I, I'd argue that he's in terms of the four attacking options that Ten Hag had on the bench. Is is Sancho a better winger than Anthony? Yes, he is, but there's no way given the the, the squad dynamic that Sancho should be on the bench ahead of Anthony. As, far as, as as I'm concerned, I, I you know I, I'd look for excuses not to have Anthony on the bench as well, and maybe when everyone is is fit, certainly if Hoyland's available, then I think it's it's a lot easier to kind of you know, d- d- do away with Anthony. But that of course also depends on other players being fit, which with United is a big if. But ultimately, there's been absolutely no no. Um, suggestion whatsoever that Sancho apologised for accusing the Manchester United manager of lying in public and 
I don't think that I don't think he should play. For, I, I didn't think he should play for United again, but he did. And you'd have had long odds on that, certainly in, in June. But they're trying to make the best of uh, it. I mean, it is a bad situation. I don't think it's good for Ten Hard to be going into next season with with Sancho and and also Rashford in, in the squad. Um, I think Rashford, you know, in fairness to both of them, they have looked, they, they did look, you know, driven and and reasonably sharp in pre season, and and they've they've been professional as well. But you can't say that they are two forwards you can rely on, and that that is an issue with United's attack because if you just look at the first team, the, the, the section on the on the website, it's Hoyland, Rashford, Xerxes, Ahmad, Garnacho, Anthony, Sancho, Wheatley. That's you know, top four is a is a big big ask with those players, and of course they will be serviced by Fernandez's brilliance and, and Fernandez there's every chance he'll outscore most of those players over the course of the season but there may be four players there that four players that you'd want um, and, and maybe four players that you wouldn't want uh, for the forthcoming season but they're always going to be saddled with Anthony because of you know because of how unwanted he is and because of PSR Rashford, there was never going to be a market for him. So it's with 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 Rashford and Anthony, the onus is on them for people to say that United aren't saddled with them, but they're lucky to have them. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's 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 on Ten Hag to get Rashford up to speed. Rashford is a twenty seven turns twenty seven in October. Anthony, you can maybe cut a little bit of slack for, but. He's also a signing, you know, he's a signing that I don't think United should have made and that there hasn't been a great deal of evidence to suggest that he's been a, a, a worthy signing after you know, an, an okay-ish first season. It was a pretty dreadful second season from him. And it's, yeah, you know, his privileges that he once had under Ten Hag have well and truly been revoked. He's, he's not had a kick in these first two games either. And he didn't do a great deal in pre-season um, to think of it, I'm struggling to think if he actually started in in, in any of the games across pre-season. I don't think he did, did he? Because he didn't play in those two European friendlies. And then I don't think he started in any of the, the tour games. So, you know, the, the, the only prominence we've seen from Anthony recently was the, the interview we did at, at United's Hotel in, in Beverly Hills. If he hadn't have done that, then I don't think there'd be a great deal of noise about him. Yeah, I was thinking about betters, but of course Ahmad scored because he scored in the first. Uh, sorry, Ahmad started because he scored in the first half um, in the states. So that says it all. There was actually a clip of Anthony standing up, thinking he was coming on. I think when Delit was getting prepared to to enter the game, and he just kind of awkwardly sat back down. Uh, there was also, I mean, I've had great footage from the Community Shield when um, United scored, Ganacho scored, and Tenog turned to celebrate next to the person who he was standing with, and it turned out it was Sancho. And Sancho. Was, oh, yeah, <laughs> looked back towards the goal. I mean, those two moments kind of say it all about where those two players are at in the United careers. But as you say, I'd still actually rather have, um, well, I mean, if last season hadn't have happened in his behaviour problems, I would still have Sancho ahead of Anthony um, in terms of quality because, I mean, Anthony's just done nothing, has he? Um, and I just can't see how he gets back into this team now and how he turns things around. You can't write a player off indefinitely, I suppose. You'd still like to give him a little bit of hope, but he's just been so, so poor. And when you think about Ahmad, who didn't make a Premier League start until May last season, it took him all season to actually get into the team. And now Ahmad's streets ahead of Anthony, isn't he? He really is. He is. And it's what he's starting for the last five United games now, or is it, sorry, it's five, five out of the last six because he started the final three in the Premier League last season. So it's the last five Premier League games, um, isn't it? It's, I, I think, or is it four Premier League games? I'm getting my numbers wrong here. I think it's the last four Premier League games that Ahmad has started five in the last six. And his, his pre-season merited that as well. And his form towards the end of last season merited that. Good goal against Newcastle, good performance against Newcastle, did quite well against Arsenal as well. It, it was strange that Ten Hag took as long as he did to actually put him in the team. It was strange that he started Amari Forson ahead of him against Fulham. That, especially given the importance of that game as well, uh, where United had won all their games in February and Hoyland had just got injured. You'd have thought, you know, played his strengths in the end he, he played someone who frankly just looked like a competition winner that day and I never really saw what Ten Hag saw in Amari Force and then in the end it didn't even pay off because he, 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 his contract 
was he just ran ran his contract down and he's he's left and gone to gone to Monza. So it, it's not as if you look at that right hand side and you think United are really strong there because Ahmad has got a long way to go to truly establish himself in the team, but he has got the skill set to do it. He's quick, he's direct, he's dynamic, he's got the crowd on his side, he has shown it at a very difficult level in English football as well in the championship with Sunderland last season was a progressive season for him even though he didn't have many starts the amount of times he came on in games and did well it said it all that he was coming on in games when United were either drawing or losing he's he's a bit of a cult figure for that goal against Liverpool and rightly so and there's an awful lot of goodwill there and United fans really truly hope that he does well and certainly I wouldn't I would not be taking him out of the team against Brighton this week. Anthony has got a long way to go and he's what into the third year of a five-year contract. So if he doesn't do anything this year and PSR would be a little bit easier to shift him next year, then yeah, that's that, that, that would be the time to really proactively look to, to get him out of the club if he doesn't do much this season. But he's, look, he's, he's lucky that he's getting a third season at United yesteryear a player who'd underperformed as much as he had in these first two seasons. They they wouldn't have a prayer of getting the third season. But the di- you know, it's it, it is a very different era now with PSR and that does has constraints on clubs on how they can buy and also how they can sell. Pilacho and Amad are twenty and twenty two respectively. But I still think that's the strongest United have been on the right wing in a long time actually, having those two options. I mean compare it to having Anthony and Sancho as your oh, options with, on the right yeah, wing. Yeah with with, with, with Garnacho yeah, I I agree with you. If, if you um if you're to temporarily take Garnacho from the left and and put him on the right, those two options are really good options. I, I completely agree. I I still kind of see Garnacho as mainly a left winger, even though of course he he's come on uh, on the right in in both games so far this season. Yeah, you could see Garnacho eventually coming back on the left at some point, but when you think of his best performances, they've actually all come on the right. Did it for the first time, obviously, at Christmas against Aston Villa when he scored those two goals. But he continued to play on the right for the, the remainder of the season. He started this season in that manner as well, obviously playing there in the Community Shield and, and against uh, Fulham on the opening day. So I think it's really interesting, actually, that Ganacho's played better on that side um, because he takes it around players, he crosses the ball in instead of kind of cutting in, which wingers tend to do in the modern day. And I love an old-school winger who kind of takes us the ball and he, plays the ball. Would, would, you, would you say he's... he's undeniably played better on the right than the left. I think he has. I think he has, yeah, definitely. It's an in- Do you not agree? There's there's no what I'd say is is that there's there's a piece in that, I think. Uh just just comparing it. I mean, you know, the fact that I'm still looking at him through the prism, like looking at him as as a left winger, and I'm sure a lot of other people are as well. And I mean we go to so many games, it's sometimes a difficult to keep track of um, or, or recall where a player started. I mean, just just looking at. I know transfer mart is not always accurate, but given that these games are quite recent, it said for the final one, two, three, four, five, six league games of last season, he was on the left wing, played on the right wing a couple of games before that, um, and of course he switched to the right wing for for the FA Cup final. But yeah, Ch- I mean Chelsea I mean, when massive. he got the two 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 goals at Chelsea he was on the left, wasn't he? Because Anthony was on the right that night, and Anthony played played extremely well but also um i think it might be something in your theory because it seems like he was well he definitely was when he got two goals against west ham he was on the right so if we if we go through it with a fine tooth comb left uh, in terms of just his goals great goal against everton didn't really matter where he was but he was on the left that night two against villa from the right two against west ham from the right two against chelsea from the left of course, one against City from the right in the FA Cup final, one from the right against City in the Community Shield. Um, Crystal Palace, if you want to count that, and the League Cup, he was on the left that night. So it's, uh, uh, you, you might be it's on leaning something towards there, the right, definitely. isn't it? Yeah, it definitely is. It's, it's, it's certainly, you, there's, it, there's, a, there's, definitely, there's definitely a debate to be had on it. And it's just whether you want that, and, and certainly where you've got an outright number nine to service, do you want that old? It's not old school winger, is it? Really, it's it's ridiculous to suggest a right footer playing on the right is is old school or old fashioned. But you you are going to have to have someone who's going to be very direct. And certainly, I thought United missed 
uh, Garnacho's directness in the first half against Fulham. But it is interesting that it's actually a much more of a debate than I thought it was. So thank thank you, Stephen. You've, you've I mean, to, to, to I, have sincerely the, you've 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 enlightened me. <laughs> to have the quality to do that, I think is fantastic. I mean, you talk about Jaden Sancho, who was brought to the club to play on the right wing. He was always better on the left, and his performances on the right just weren't good enough. So you'd see him pop across the left, and he'd occasionally pop up. But for Ganacho to have that quality on either side and to be able to have an influence, regardless of where he plays, I'd argue, yeah, he mentality is on the right. Yeah, it's it's great to see, and he's, he's such a talent. Um, we are going to have a departure from the right wing, though, Samuel, because Fecunda Palestri seems to be closing in on an exit from the club to Penarfiarcos. I mean, he joined from Penarol for nine million in October twenty twenty. You laughing at my pronunciation there? That was a that was a decent uh, decent go. It, it can be tricky with Greek. I think it's Panathinaikos, isn't it? But again, they played against United when I was a kid, so I've they've they've been in my. I didn't uh, think my pronunciation. I've, they've been on my bad. radar for quite. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move well, on. But um, maybe, maybe, but, it's, maybe it's just your accent. I, I, I can't yeah, hold it well, against you. It's, it's too endearing. The northeast, yeah. <laughs> Um, but no, it makes sense. I think look, he's he's failed to convince that he is good enough to start for United. He's never really shook off the reputation that he's better. Um, obviously, he's an impact substitute, really, isn't he? That's his reputation. He's able to shake that off. And I think back to the Bayern Munich game in the Champions League. He was given a huge chance that night. Didn't yeah. really convince. Um, and I think he kind of never recovered from there. It should wasn't have scored, shouldn't he? As well, he should have. Yeah, and it wasn't a surprise to see him leave in January. Um, that was his third loan away. And if you're leaving United three times on loan, your future clearly isn't at the club, I would argue. So not a surprise to see Palestri um, closing in on a departure. Especially when those three loans are uh, to overseas clubs as well. It's it's four years, it's four starts. He didn't properly perform in any of those starts. He, he maybe did okay on his full debut against Real Betis, but he didn't exactly set the world light. And that, that has always been his problem. He's been a really good game changer. He's done well several times coming on in games but as a starter he's he's never cut it and and some of those starts were quite were quite kind I think it was like Crystal Palace at home in the league last season games where you should get a lot of the ball you should be able to create a fair bit and he's he's never seemed up to it he's he's clearly a good footballer but the I think Panathinaikos would be extremely underwhelming um, for a player who I, I think could do well in another top five league whether it's a at a Spanish side, but Spanish teams by and large are, are pretty skint. So I think it was always a tall order for one of them to to actually outright buy a Palistri. But I think you said, could you see him in Germany? And probably could see him in Germany, but maybe not now. And, and Panathinaikos would be, would be very underwhelming. It's the kind of club where players go to when they're in their early 30s, you'd think. But Palistri is a he's, he's a starter for Uruguay. He's only only 22. So, so going there is... So it's yeah, it's it's unusual to, to an extent, but also it you know, because of the lack of money certain clubs have and and his profile, you know, who, who really would actually want to part with money to 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 sign him. But United need to be getting a profit out of him because yeah, as I said, full Uruguay international played at a World Cup, played at Copa America, played four years at Man United, played in La Liga, only cost nine million pounds. They've got to be getting a good fee for him, but maybe they won't be. I mean, I'm I'm not too sure how much money Panathinaikos have got to play with. I think seven million has been suggested um, elsewhere. I mean, obviously, had two yeah, that that'd be poor. Deputy, yeah, he had two loan spells with Deportivo, um, and was on loan at Granada last season. But it was Alaves, Alaves, wasn't it? Yeah, Deportivo Alaves, but they finished bottom of La Liga Granada <laughs> last season, so. I've, yes. I've I've never heard that. I've, I know I know Deportivo La Coruña. That's the, that's the only Deportivo I I know. But that's that, that is, is the club's hipster, name. Deportivo that is the club's Alaves. Name. <laughs> when, when did when did that change? Everyone just calls them Alaves. I I remember when they got to here. I am showing my age when you were in your crib still probably. But I remember them getting to the UEFA Cup final and losing to Liverpool in in two thousand one. They've they've always been just Alaves to me. But maybe. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm just I'm just getting old and I'm, and I'm behind the time, Stephen. <laughs> Reinventing the wheel uh, as usual on this podcast. Yeah. But I mean, look, if he's if he's spent six months uh, at a club who finished bottom of the Liga, I think it's fascinating how he starts for Uruguay, really. Um, because Marcelo Bielsa really likes him. Um, and obviously, yeah, he does. Yeah. So it is interesting. He was involved in the World Cup as well, wasn't he? So you, you think his resale? It's, it's a shame to some extent. 
it's a shame for United that Bielsa is still not in charge of Leeds because there's every chance that Leeds would have just spent twenty five or thirty million pounds on him as they did with uh, Daniel James, with Daniel Martin. James, which is just yeah. one of the, I mean, great, great fee for United, but one of the most bizarre, bizarre sales they've managed to negotiate. See, I'd rather have Daniel James on my side than Facundo Palestri. I think it's more effective. Well, well, raised eyebrows. Like that. We've not agreed on much. Yeah, yeah, there, there, there'll be some raised eyebrows. That bombshell. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for your time as usual thank you ever so much again as always Stephen and thanks to listeners <clears throat> pardon me have a great week we'll be back later in the week to preview the Brighton game take care